Good morning and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. It is truly a joy to be able to worship together in the house of the Lord. I want to paint a picture for you all of that feeling that you get on Friday afternoons when you're wrapping up work and you're finishing up school and you have a weekend of endless possibilities. Remember that feeling that you feel free with all that energy and all that potential for the next couple days to be able to enjoy your weekend. Or imagine that feeling that if you're a student where you just finished a big test and you're heading actually into summer vacation. Imagine that feeling when you finish a great week worth of work, you just presented, had a big project or had to do a PowerPoint in front of your boss and it went well, and you're heading into the winter break where you have time off for the holidays. It's this feeling of wonder and, and potential that we cling to, right? Because we're free. We no longer have to study or we no longer have to worry about work, at least for a couple of days. We know that as believers in Christ, we have an even greater freedom. That because Christ died for us, the Bible talks about how we are free from our sins. We are free from the penalty of death, even. Because we have a future eternal hope in Jesus Christ to look forward to. And there's this wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, I'd like to read for you. So if you're able, would you please stand as I read God's word? The passage says this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so as this passage illustrates, we are now free to worship. We are free to come before God, offering up all that we have in our song and in our praise. Because when God sees us, he sees his son. We are changed. We are transformed. We are new creations in Christ. And so with that in mind, let's open this time in prayer and worship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come before you. We rejoice that we are free. And so may we respond with worship and praise, offering up our very lives as living sacrifices to you. Father, we ask that we would no longer feel ashamed or guilty or burdened by our sins or our old ways, our addictions. All of those things no longer have any power over us because of what Jesus has done. We thank you that we are victorious in Christ, that we have a new life. Because he is risen, we are risen as well. And so we come before you with our praise, lifting up all that we have to you, to your great, magnificent name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. No, we not it was for me. He died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to. Calvary, 
the chasm. team. Well, good morning. 
Um, I have the privilege of preaching this morning and continuing um, going back into the book of Luke. Um, we, uh, and I also have the privilege of introducing our yearly theme for 2024. Uh, Pastor Steve, the past three weeks, have been, uh, has been addressing this uh, topic of sanctification. Uh, and he, he pointed out that there's three phases. The first is uh, the regenerated phase, which if we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, uh, that, then uh, this kind of re- regenerated stage has already come. And uh, our position before God is sinless and clean. God uh, sees us as uh, clean by the blood of the Lamb, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then he talked about this reformatted stage, which is kind of where we currently are in right now. Uh, where uh, there's this present sanctification in which we are all striving to become more like Christ. And the last is what we're hoping uh, for when Jesus comes back again, which is this perfected stage. This, this is the future sanctification when uh, all are made perfect once again, and uh, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more pain when Christ comes back again. He addressed this, um, and, and he talked about kind of this transformation that we have. And, uh, and, and this process that we go through. Now, as we go back into the book of Luke, what we'll see for this year uh, is we're going to be focusing on uh, the middle phase, the reformatted stage, the what do we do now that we believe in Jesus Christ while we wait for Jesus to come back again? What does a life that is committed to Jesus Christ look like? What does a transformed life look like? And so as we dive into our text this morning, I'm going to kick it off for uh, all of us this year uh, in beginning to describe for us what that looks like. And uh, I get the privilege, especially in 2024, uh, to talk about our allegiances. I title our message in Luke 11, 14 to 28, Allegiance to King Jesus. Allegiance to King Jesus. Uh, Specifically, pledging allegiance to King Jesus. 2024 is going to be a very interesting year. Uh, specifically, uh, politically speaking, it's an election year. And I imagine you guys have different political affiliations. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about I'm not going to talk about it at all, except for, for just uh, this one point. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, a transformed life looks like pledging allegiance not to the United States, not to a president, not to a party, a political party, but to the kingdom of God, to King Jesus himself. That is who we pledge allegiance to. And there's multiple parts that kind of fit in with this allegiance to King Jesus and what a transformed life looks like, and there's three. Number one, a transformed life, like I said, pledges allegiance to King Jesus. But if you pledge allegiance to King Jesus, then that means that in your heart it's occupied by the Holy Spirit. That it's occupied by the Holy Spirit. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like hearing and doing the word of God hearing and doing the Word of God. And so, would you please open up your Bibles or your phones to Luke 11, 14 to 28. I'll read it out loud, and if you guys could follow along, okay? And it goes like this. <clears throat> and if I can get the back to advance the slides for me for this part. Uh, it says this, Now he was casting out a demon. This is Jesus that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and, divide, um, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges." But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own place, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Moving on to 24. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest and finding none. It's, uh, none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. 
and 27. And he said these things, uh, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time. I think that we have the privilege of hearing your word this morning. That we get to understand more about what a transformed life looks like. What a life that pledges allegiance to King Jesus looks like. I ask that, we would, uh, that you would open up our hearts, open up our ears and our minds to really soak this in and to live this out today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> you know, one of the questions that I got, uh, that I actually still get especially when I was at Berkeley and even now, is on the issue of sin. Okay, and uh, the question kind of goes like this. Uh, Pastor Chris, if I continue in the sins uh, that I remember my parents or my church said was a sin, but now culture says it's acceptable, or even the church says, ah, I don't know if it's really a sin, it's more of a gray matter, right? Um, does that mean I'm, I'm not saved? If I keep sinning on these things, does that mean that I'm not saved? Isn't being saved simply believing in Jesus' his death and resurrection on the cross? I've done that, so I should be okay, right? They ask this question all the time. And for some reason, and maybe uh, this is more of a recent movement in evangelism, there's a lack of a biblical clear gospel message. You see, one of the most essential aspects to salvation is missing when we share the gospel. We say, do you uh, accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, right? We say things uh, like, um, you just have to believe it, that Jesus died for your sins, but there's a key aspect that we're missing, and it is this fact, and we often skip over it. It is that Jesus is your Savior, but more importantly, he's your Lord and King. You see, before Jesus was Savior, he was Lord. Before Jesus was your friend, he was King. Before anything else, you must realize this. Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is King. See, this idea of kings, lords, emperors, this is kind of a foreign concept to us here in America, and actually must the, uh, much of the world. Uh, but I imagine through media and through history, you kind of have a general idea of what kings, lords, and emperors, uh, and, and that kind of time period in that reign, right? And uh, the reality is, back then, if you disrespect, disregard, and disobey the king, what's the result? It's off with your head. That's right, Mickey. You dead. Right? Even if it's not true, even if it's just in passing, all it takes is one little disrespect toward the king, and you're dead. Off with your head. And like I said, this might be a foreign concept when it comes to understanding kings, but you have to realize this. Jesus is our king if you believe in him as your Lord and Savior. He is your Lord. He saves his people. This is, this is a strange concept for any king, actually. Kings don't save their people. They make decrees to save their people. <laughs> kings don't physically go and save those that need saving. No, what does he do? He sends soldiers and commanders to do his work. He simply sits on his throne. King Jesus did not do that. King Jesus physically came down in the form of man to save us. The king saved us. Us, the king sacrificed himself for us. This is the beauty of the gospel message. Before Jesus was Savior, Jesus was Lord. Before Jesus died on the cross, he was the king, and thus the Lord of all. The king of the kingdom of God was the one who saved you, was the one who died for you, was the one who befriended you. So when you say, Jesus is a friend of mine, no, he's king. He's Lord before he was your friend. And so when it comes to salvation and being saved, Jesus is not just some app that you open to give you some, some tidbits of wisdom. He's not some guru that will give you advice on to how to live your best life now. No, Jesus is your king. He is your Lord. And a truly transformed heart then submits to the king, pledges allegiance to the king, and lives under the king's rules. And so as we look at our text this morning, there are three things. A transformed life pledges allegiance to King Jesus, but then it is occupied by the Holy Spirit. And what does this transformed life look like? Well, it looks like hearing and doing the word of God. See, as we get into our text in uh, verses 14 to 16, we first see Jesus, right, in our text this morning. We first see Jesus. He does a miracle. He casts out a demon 
who was mute. The demon was mute, and as such, the individual, uh, this person was mute as well, could not speak, but was probably convulging and acting strangely, and they said he was demon-possessed. You know, what you need to understand is, if you look later on, or in our text, in verse 19, uh, it's very clear that actually the Jews also had exorcists that could cast out demons. The Jews had that. Okay? Exorcism actually was a very common practice. Demon possession actually was very common back then. Okay? And, uh, but the Jews, when it came to casting out demons, they'd actually have this big, grand ceremony. I would imagine the kind of ceremony that we're going to see when Brock Purdy comes onto the field today, right? The, you know, fireworks going up. Here comes the Jewish exorcist to cast it. And they're like, yeah, cast it out of this demon, right? All celebrating, right, and casting it out. And, um, and when they cast it out, then he, he runs back like the 49ers are going to win today and runs back in the tunnel and interviews. What was it like casting out that demon, right? It's fantastic. Uh, but there's one key thing when it comes to uh, the Jewish exorcists that they needed in order to cast out a demon. They believed that they needed the name of that demon. Not the name of the person, the name of the demon in order to cast out that demon. So what's the problem here? This man was mute and could not speak. And so if he could not speak, then pretty much the Jewish exorcists went, well, sorry, I can't help you. I cannot help you. They forfeited the game, right? They couldn't participate. And so uh, they added a stipulation. The Jews had so many laws. They added a stipulation that you don't find in your text. You have to, to, to dive into history. And the stipulation is the only way a demon could be cast out of a mute individual is if it was the Messiah. As if it was the Messiah. And so what does Jesus do? He shows up. And he casts out a demon from this mute individual. He casts out a mute demon. But does anybody recognize him as the Messiah? Maybe some. But the first thing we see is that people challenged his, his authority in casting out that demon. Right? In, our, in Matthew's account, in Matthew 12, uh, the sum, right, but some of them said, the sum was actually the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, perhaps even the Jewish exorcists. And they said, what is going on here? No, 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 no. There was no ceremony. There was no Jesus running onto the field. casting. He was just like, come out. And it came out. And they said, the only way Jesus could do that is if Satan himself told them the name of that demon. So he's on Satan's side. This man is of the devil, is what they told, what they told the crowd, what they were gossiping about. And then we see in verses 17 to 19, it goes like this. But he, meaning Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. There is two kind of points that Jesus kind of begins to debate with them and argue with them logically. The first is this, in verses 17 to 18. What kingdom would ever fight against itself in order to win? It wouldn't. See, Satan is the ruler of this earth. He rules what's happening. He has dominion on this earth, and he wants to maintain what is his. So why would he tell Jesus to cast out a demon from someone when Satan clearly wants the demon inside of his people? He would not. It would not be divided. But then on top of that, like I said in verse 19, there were Jewish exorcists. And he tells these leaders, these Pharisees, wait a minute. If you say that I'm casting out demons by Satan, Beelzebub, what gives you right to say that your Jewish exorcists are casting it out of, uh, out of God's name rather than Beelzebub? Out of Satan. What gives you right to say that they're, what they're doing is more holy than what I am doing? That's his logical reasoning. He says, You can't say that I'm casting it out of Satan. Satan would never do that against himself. And even your exorcists do the same thing that I'm doing. So are they doing it uh, in Satan's name? No. And then we see in verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. See, I love this phrase, um, this, this finger of God. Based on his two points, he says, 
But if it's not of Beelzebub, if it's not of the devil, then it is of God. And I love this phrase, finger of God. It gives the sense of ease, does it not? He doesn't need no ceremony. He doesn't need a playbook. He doesn't need a whole team. It's just one finger, one pinky, to cast out that demon. The finger of God. The simplicity that it takes for Jesus, for God, to cast out a demon. But also it displays the strength, does it not, of God himself. And in Matthew's account of this situation, instead of fingers of God, it says the spirit of God. They're one and the same. They're one and the same. The finger of God and the spirit of God. And if Jesus really did this by the power of God, and, uh, it, it, is it, it, and if it's truly the Messiah who's doing it, then that means that the king has come. That the king has come, right? And that's why it says at the end of verse 20, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If the Messiah did truly cast out this demon, and it's done by the finger of God, then the king is right in front of you. And where the king goes, the kingdom is. See, the king, back in those times, is the heartbeat, is the lifebeat of the kingdom of God. If the king dies, then there's no kingdom anymore. And so what he's saying to these Pharisees is, do you not recognize that the king is right in front of you? The kingdom of God is right here. Where is your respect? Where is your respect? Where is your worship? But not only that, <clears throat> The king has come, but the king is also taking over. The king is taking over. See, we see this in Luke 11, 21 to 23. There's this kind of strange uh, uh, kind of uh, story, not really a story, but an example that Jesus is trying to communicate, right? When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when, when, uh, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divided his spoils. See, in 21 to 22, there's this idea of a strong man. And what Jesus is trying to say is this strong man is actually Satan. This strong man is Satan. Satan's called the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. The ruler of this world in John 12.31. This title kind of conveys the power that Satan actually has. And you'd be deceiving yourself to think that, ah, Satan doesn't have anything on me. No, he does. He does. But you see, there's someone stronger, and that someone stronger is Jesus, who comes in and attacks Satan, overcomes Satan. He takes away what Satan thinks that he has and gives it back to God. You see, in Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, it says this, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, meaning Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which in his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. You see, Jesus is the stronger one who attacks Satan and overcomes Satan and all that Satan held dear now returns back to God. And then Jesus flips the script on these Jewish leaders, these Pharisees who claim that Jesus is on Satan's side and he says, no, you actually are on Satan's side. And he says this in verse 23. This is a king's decree. This is a king's declaration of war. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The king has declared, you're either on my side, or you're the enemy. And they will scatter. Jesus flips the script and says, I am the Messiah, the king, based on the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in this world to heal and to save. You're either on my side or you're not. You either recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, leading you to Jesus Christ as king and you obey him, or you don't, regardless of how good, moral, or successful you are. All of it actually is a work of the devil, and as such, you are against God and will scatter. That's a strong warning. You see, a transformed life is one that is on Jesus' side. The life that was once occupied by Satan, but has been overcome by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and turns from evil and acknowledges and pledges allegiance to none other than King Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. 
So we're going to move on. If you pledge allegiance to King Jesus, if you call him Lord, then you're occupied by the Holy Spirit. See, we, we have this interaction here. Jesus talks about it, this, uh, another example of this unclean spirit or a demon, right? When, when the unclean spirit has gone out from a person, so this demon, when it comes, this uh, other demon comes out of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest, right? These demons on this earth want to find a home, a place to rest. And in finding none, it says, I'll return to my house from which I came out. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. What's happening here? What he's saying is the, uh, the demons, the, these demons that are casted out by Jewish leaders, by human effort, by anything other than Jesus Christ, they will leave. They, you can actually uh, cast out demons from people without Jesus, is what he's trying to say. But it'll find no place to rest, and eventually it'll go back home. It'll go back into the soul of the individual that it possessed. And it'll return, and the house is tidied, put together. This, this uh, reforming of an individual by his own effort, putting things back together is nice and neat. And technically, this demon can't really live there. It's too clean, and so what does he do? He gets his buddies, and he says, Hey! Guess what? There's an empty home, nice and clean, nobody inside, so let's go have a party. And he brings seven other demons, and this individual is worse off than it was before. There's a sense that demons like to reside in the souls of people. And like I said, it can be casted out without Jesus. And there's this, uh, this word uh, specifically where when the demon comes back, he says, I, I bring seven more. Seven is actually very symbolic. Seven in the Bible is completion, is a sense of completion. And so what, it, what is Jesus trying to say here? That this demon will bring seven more in the sense that now this individual is completely lost. Completely lost. But what I want to point your attention to is in verse 25. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. See, the reality is, no matter what you do, to transform your life, to reform your own life, no matter how it's done or with what effort you try to clean your life up, without Jesus, there's nothing. See, I will return, um, when it returns, it's all swept and put in order. What you have to realize is, yes, it might be swept and put in order, but it is empty. It's empty. You don't see in the text. You have to kind of put on your thinking caps. But the reality is the soul, the demon has left, put your life back in order, but it's empty. It's not filled. And so Satan and the demons can enter. It's an empty house. But a life that is truly transformed by Jesus Christ, the heart is not empty, right? It may be a mess, but the mess is being cleaned and occupied by none other than the Holy Spirit. The soul is occupied by God. It is not empty. It is full. Check this out. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. How? For he dwells with you and will be in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. It is not empty. It is full. I love this quote from Kent Hughes. Reformation without regeneration is an empty affair, leaving one open to demonic community. You can try as much as you want to reform your life, to make yourself better. You can do everything you can to avoid uh, alcohol, drugs, sex addiction, whatever it might be, any type of sin. You can do anything to reform your life, but without God, it is hopeless. You need regeneration, the regeneration that only comes through the power of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that lives inside of you. Right? This whole uh, uh, rise in meditation and emptying yourself, just don't think about anything, clear your mind, let me tell you, that is very dangerous. You shouldn't be clearing your mind, you should be filling your mind. Filling your mind so much with the Word of God, filling your mind so much with Jesus Christ that it pushes out anything else. 
That is a transformed life. Christians can be tempted, they can be tested, can be tormented, but Satan and his demons can never live in true believers of Jesus Christ. This is a, a very uh, important theological point that I want to communicate to you. That if you are a true transformed individual by the blood of the Lamb, you believe in Jesus Christ, your soul is occupied by the Holy Spirit, by God himself, and as such, you cannot be possessed by demons. You cannot be possessed by Satan himself. That does not mean, though, that you can't be tested, you can't be tempted, or tormented. But the reality is you'll never be lost because God will keep you, God will hold you, God will guide you, and he will protect you. And he will strengthen you to fight those tests, those torments, and those temptations. And finally, what is this, this allegiance to King Jesus? What does this occupied by the Holy Spirit actually look like? Well, it looks like hearing and doing the word. It says this in verses 27 to 28. And he said these things. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. See, as Jesus was, uh, as he casted out that demon and he was having this kind of uh, uh, debate with these Pharisees, a woman in the crowd, in awe of what Jesus was saying and what he did, she said, in essence, who raised you? Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. He's trying to say, my goodness, who's your mom? Your mom raised you right, taught you right. Praise God for your mother. Now, Jesus doesn't necessarily disagree, but he adds to it. Now, oftentimes, Christians will use this text to say, this is the reason why we don't worship Mary. And Catholics also use this text to say, well, he didn't say that it was wrong, so yes, we can worship the Virgin Mary. Both are not true. That's not what Jesus is doing here. Now, I'm not saying we should worship Mary. Okay? We as Christians believe that Mary is not someone to be worshipped. She is blessed. Blessed not in the sense that we need to give her blessings, but blessed in the sense that she bore Jesus. What a blessing, right? What a blessing to be the mother of Mary, but not to be worshipped. And I guarantee you, Mary is in heaven right now going, I really wish you wouldn't be worshipping me. You should be worshipping Jesus. But nonetheless, this woman says this. And Jesus does not refute that statement. He doesn't say, woman, you're wrong. Don't bless my mom. He actually says, but rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You see, Mary was blessed, not in the fact that she should be worshipped and bore Jesus Christ, but she was blessed in the fact that she heard the word of God and obeyed it, right? When the angel came and spoke to her that she would bear Jesus' son, what did she say? Yes. I don't understand, Lord. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how that's even possible, but I will obey. And that's why Jesus says, and for us as well, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. See, this is the application to our text. This is the command. This is the outward practice of a life that has been transformed by Jesus. It is one who reads the word of God but specifically listens, hears the word, soaks it in, processes the word of God, doesn't just let it go in one ear and out the other. You don't meditate to empty yourself. You meditate on the word of God day and night, thinking about it, molding over it, understanding it, letting it soak in. And then you obey it. You keep it. See, the reality is if Jesus says you hear the word of God and keep it, it's possible that you can hear the word of God and not keep it, right? And not obey. And the individual that simply hears it is also susceptible. Is evidence that perhaps that individual is not transformed. Both are necessary. Both are crucial. Both are needed as evidence of a transformed life. A transformed life that pledges allegiance to King, uh, King Jesus is occupied by the Holy Spirit. Then lives a life that wants to hear from God in his word, the Bible, and obey the commands of God. Now, I was not sure whether or not I should add this part at the end, um, because what I don't want is to have you motivated in believing in Jesus and pledging allegiance to Jesus and obeying Jesus to receive blessings, right? When it says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, right? Uh, what I don't want you to, uh, to, to um, 
to do is read the word and obey it so that you can, uh, I, I want to gain all these blessings now, right? I want to experience it now. No, I, I want you to believe and obey because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, which is the ultimate blessing. However, in this day and age, especially my generation and generations below me, we like specifics. We like to know, okay, but what kind of blessings can we get? What are some of these blessings? Now, please remember, this should not be the motivation for you to obey but none the, and, and hear. But nonetheless, I'll give it to you. There's six. This is not comprehensive. There's just six of them, okay? The blessings of hearing and doing the word of God. Number one, it confirms our faith in Jesus, right? Many of you have asked me, how do I know if I'm really saved? I know a lot of CTFers have asked that. How do I know if I'm really saved? Well, let me tell you. If you read the word of God and obey it, it solidifies or confirms our faithfulness and love to Jesus, right? Uh, I don't have this verse up, but just listen. Check this out. 1 John 2, 3 to 5. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, uh, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. You'll know if you're saved if you read the word of God and you obey the word of God. The next, you go from progression into perfection. You go from striving to be like Christ, continually working to being more and more and more like Christ until Jesus Christ comes back again. See, believers engaging with the Bible isn't merely a religious obligation, but an opportunity to deepen our relationship with God to gain wisdom, to align our lives with his principles. Regular reading and reflection on the scripture helps us grow in faith, to grow in knowledge and understanding of God's character and his plans for us. See, t 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It helps us go from the state of sin into being more like Christ. That's one of the blessings. Next is nourishment for the soul. Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus said this to the devil himself when he was tempted. And he acknowledges, Jesus says, yeah, we need food. People, humans need food. It's almost lunch. I need food because I didn't eat breakfast. We all need food. But don't neglect the soul. The soul needs the word of God. The soul needs the word of God. I'd imagine the word of God is like the best cut of prime rib. Sorry if you're a vegan. But nonetheless, right? The soul needs the word of God. Don't neglect your soul. Nourish your soul. Another blessing is peace. John 14, 23 to 27. It's a long passage, and I don't have it up. Just listen, okay? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. I love that phrase. If they keep my commandments, then we, meaning God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, will make our home with him. Counter to that demon, remember? His home was in that person. That person will be cast out, and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God, they will make a home in us. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. So we got that part. The Holy Spirit's coming. But in verse 27, this profound truth, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, it first starts off with, you must obey my commands. If you love me, you will keep my word, and we will reside in you. It's evidence that we live inside of you. And I will send someone else. When Jesus physically leaves, he'll send the Holy Spirit. And then he ends with, peace I leave with you. What does that mean? That the Holy Spirit is that peace, that rest, that comfort. 
peace I leave with you. We all have that peace. Then there's also this concept of rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, oftentimes we think of rest like lying in the Bahamas on this bamboo chair, the water flowing through, right, with a little, like my, I don't know if you believe in alcohol or not, non-alcoholic drink, okay, whatever it is, okay, and you're drinking, you're just enjoying yourself on the beach. That's not the rest that God is promising. That's not the blessing that God is giving. This blessing of rest is one that learns from Jesus. This rest is not a rest of, I just don't want to do anything and I want to veg. No, this rest is you need to actively work to obey Jesus Christ and you guarantee will have rest for your souls. And lastly, the last blessing I want to mention here, when you hear and do the word of God, is it blesses other people. See, so oftentimes when we hear blessings, I was like, okay, God, I want to know what blessing I personally can get. I want to know what I get out of this. What you don't realize is perhaps you might not get anything except bless others. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, right? The word of Christ dwelling in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's not teaching yourself, that may be true, but it says teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom singing out loud. I love this. I've said this before. When it comes to worship, when we're at this church together and we're singing songs, when the worship team is leading us in worship, oftentimes we come in going, okay, how can I get my own heart ready for this? Uh, and, and this whole day, this whole morning is between me and God. Wrong. When you come gathered here, it's not you and God, it's the church and God. You're part of a body. So when you sing out loud the words, when you sing of the praise, when you sing a hallelujah to your king, it's not just you and God, it's the church to God, glorifying God for what he has done, glorifying King Jesus. And when you sing out loud, let me tell you, there's one that you might feel it when you're worshiping in the shower or in the car. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, right? You're whatever it might be, right? You're feeling it. But let me tell you, there's something so much more powerful when you're gathered with the church body singing out loud. Not just to God, but when you sing, those notes just don't go up to God. It goes to who? One another. When you sing out loud with the congregation of believers collectively, it's like an army chant. Praise be to God. Together, collectively, it pierces the soul so much more. Right? When the words and commands of God dwell and live inside of our thoughts and our actions enables us to teach and admonish others the way God wants us to. And as such, that's a blessing for others. Right? When a parent obeys the Lord and does not embitter their children, the family reaps the reward. When a child obeys <laughs> right? their parents, the Lord, uh, uh, then, then the whole family, the parents are overjoyed. There's this idea that when you are obedient to the word of God, others are blessed. When we live obedient lives, those who know and love us will sense peace and joy that he's given us. Instead of conflict, there will be contentment. And this is just one part of experiencing God's goodness. That you get to bless others when you read the word and obey it. See, the transformed life is one that pledges allegiance to King Jesus, is occupied by the Holy Spirit, then lives a life that wants to hear from God in his word, the Bible, and obey his commands. And the blessings that you'll receive is that it confirms your faith in Jesus. It helps you become more like Christ, nourishes the soul, gives you peace that you so long for, rest that you need, and finally it blesses the body of Christ. Would you please pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the blessing of your word, I ask that as we sing songs of praise to you, that we would sing not simply to you, God, but to encourage one another, the body of Christ. That we are all claiming as we sing hallelujah, praise be to you. What a wonderful, amazing truth of your son dying on the cross. What amazing grace, God, that we would be pledging allegiance as the body of Christ to you and you alone. 
that we would acknowledge the fact that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, not simply to empty ourselves, but to be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to hear the Word of God, to read the Word of God, to meditate on the Word of God, and live it out every single day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Would you all please stand as we continue our time in worship with music? Jeff, thank you, worship team. We just have a few announcements to close out our service. Our Adventure Club series is commencing again 
Uh, this Friday, we have a bit of a change. Uh, Adventure Club will be meeting downstairs in the Antioch CTF room, uh, mainly because we are running a series this month with our junior hires and high schoolers and their parents on creation and evolution. Richard Stepanek, who is one of our missionaries we support, is going to be sharing. And so please uh, keep that in mind uh, next Friday as well as uh, the 16th. Next uh, Sunday is the first of the month. We have our regular food and fellowship. Please plan to join us after second service. We will be uh, sharing uh, a meal together. Our wonderful staff is actually preparing a Japanese curry lunch. So please join us. Invite your friends, your neighbors. Uh, along with that, we're also having our first quarterly business meeting of the year. Uh, one of our most important members, please plan on attending. Uh, next Sunday, we're also back to getting normal, a little step by step. We're gonna go back to, uh, for communion, we have our communion service the first of every month, and we're gonna uh, go back to the regular elements. We'll have both the, kind of the containers, but uh, just be prepared, and we're uh, thankful that we can take one step closer to uh, our normal uh, uh, kind of uh, behavior, so. Uh, also, I wanted to make you all aware, we are having a Super Bowl outreach this is in no way a premonition of what will happen. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but uh, be in prayer. Regardless of who's in the Super Bowl, we have a wonderful time of fellowship. Our pastors uh, prepare ribs, and uh, it's just a time where we get together. Uh, we will be sharing the gospel during halftime, so please bring out your friends and family. Uh, it's just a time where we take the opportunity to share the good news. Uh, women's ministry is started already. If you haven't signed up yet, please do so. Daisy and Kayla are out in the foyer. We have our Bible studies on Wednesdays, and then we have our life groups as well. Uh, be out there. If you have any questions, uh, they'll answer them for you. Our uh, handbell ministry is a wonderful ministry uh, where we get together folks to share and uh, worship in handbell. And we have our Easter retreat, I'm sorry, Easter service coming up uh, in March, and they are organizing and getting together. So Grace has asked for those to want to participate in this ministry. Uh, to reach out to her, the practice begins February 11th. And then later on in February, we are having a baptism service. If you or anyone you know is interested in getting baptized, sharing their testimony uh, on coming to Christ, uh, this is the time to do it. Reach out to Pastor Kevin. We do need folks to sign up. Uh, there is some preparation involved. Uh, thank you to those who continue to support our church financially. Uh, if you haven't done so and gotten your donation receipt, uh, this is the place to do it. There's a QR code also on the website. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or our church treasurer. Um, last but not least, we want to remember or think about uh, Alan Graham, our dear uh, friend who is serving out in Ecuador. Uh, as you may or may uh, remember, Pastor Steve was out there just a couple months ago. Ecuador is undergoing um, a very violent time right now in January. Uh, there were some uh, criminal organizations who uh, attacked a TV station and universities. Um, Alan has emailed and shared that they're doing well, but everything is not normal there. Folks are uh, remote, uh, schools are online, uh, but he's grateful for uh, our prayers and he asks continue uh, prayer for the safety of their team out there. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for your salvation that you give us and Father, there'll be a day when our transformation will be complete, when we will be in your presence every day, where living in the joy of our salvation will be breathing and living and it'll be normal. But until then, Father, you have challenged us and you have encouraged us and you have continued to teach us in your word. And thank you for Pastor Chris's exhortation this morning that living in your word is living and breathing the kingdom. And Father, we are grateful for the promises you give us, for the power that we have in our salvation, and Father, that you are working in us to transform us and to use us to reach those who don't know you. We are grateful for Alan and his life ministry in Ecuador and for the many decades that he's been there and seeing firsthand what's happening. And Father, you use uh, the evil of this world to ultimately bring those whom you have called to you. And we want to pray for... Um, HCJD and uh, Reach Beyond and their ministry, and Father, that you would protect them, that you would build faith and trust and confidence, and Father, that you would help the people of Ecuador come to know you. We thank you for this morning, and we're grateful for 
uh, all that you do for us. Bless this afternoon, and thank you for this time in your son's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You're dismissed.